uh, Mr. Chairman and dear colleagues, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I would like to uh, thank Dr. Amr al-Habib and the organizing committee for inviting me to talk to you uh, on osteoporosis and the spine. Um, I think it's very obvious that it's a, uh, it's a, surgi it's a surgeon's audience uh, because many of, the, of them are not probably coming to that part, but hopefully they will come later uh, for the debate. So um, uh, I was asked to uh, address the uh, problem of vertebral fracture as related to osteoporosis. And uh, just a quick, uh, I hope I'm using this properly. Okay, uh, maybe I can use this one. Okay. So just a quick uh, summary. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of osteoporosis as a disease, the definition of the disease that came only um, a couple of decades ago, even though it's a very old disease, and that came in uh, 1993. There has been some modification later on with some emphasis on the bone strength and the bone quality rather than uh, just the BMD. And this is just a picture to show you the difference between normal uh, bone tissue and osteoporotic uh, tissue. So now we address bone quality along with BMD and we talk about bone strength. And that's what ultimately leads to fracture. It's a prevalent disease, it's a very common disease uh, and increasing worldwide. So uh, in, the, uh, in the North in North America, European countries, Japanese and destroying cohorts. This is the prevalence of the disease in, uh, in women. Osteoporotic fracture, which is the main sequelae of the disease, that's why we are interested in treating and preventing osteoporosis. Uh, an osteoporotic fracture occurs every three seconds. A vertebral fracture occurs every 22 seconds. So it's a very common prevalent disease. Almost a quarter of Caucasian women and men over the age of 50 will have multiple vertebral fractures. So, and this is a very serious condition, as we will discuss in a minute. So it's a it's like a ticking bomb. So uh, if you notice that the prevalence of the fracture is so common, we need to address what causes that and try to prevent it. And this is just to show you the lifetime risk uh, after age 50 of all uh, fractures. And you can see that uh, the vertebral fractures are as common, if not more, than the hip fracture, and it's more common that the more feared disease, breast cancer and prostate cancer. People worry about cancer more than worrying about fracturing their bones. Uh, all kinds of fractures increase with age, more so in women. So we know that increases as we get old. And it's more prevalent that the more fear diseases, the heart attacks, the stroke, and the breast cancer. In women, actually, if you combine all three, it's still less than the prevalence of fractures in women. There is an increased burden of osteoporotic fracture worldwide, but it's going to be more so in Asia. So by 2050, we believe there will be an explosion of fractures, including hip and vertebral fractures, because we have a young population that's going to age. So if we do not address the problem early, we're going to be facing a huge problem. Uh, we know that it incurs direct costs of medical uh, uh, treatment and rehabilitation and long term, but also there's the indirect cause of morbidity, loss of working days, uh, some of the costs you cannot quantify like the deterioration of the quality uh, of life. And this is the projected co uh, uh, cost of the disease. Again, going up in Europe, in USA, but look at Asia. So we know it's going to be prevalent and it's going to be very costly. We know that vertebral fracture is underdiagnosed and even though it incurs, it uh, constitutes around 60% of the total direct cause of osteoporotic fracture, but this is again a very um, uh, costly uh, complication. It costs the USA around $1 billion uh, dollar and in Europe around 700 million. So it's not just um, a, a fatal disease or a serious disease. It does cost a lot of money and it uh, burdens the, uh, the finances of any country. It is the most common osteoporotic fracture, as I've shown you in the slide before. It can occur without any trauma. So just doing routine daily activities like bending and lifting and turning can lead to a vertebral fracture. Over the age of 50, men 
and women have the same prevalence of vertebral fracture, mainly because in men, we have the presence of traumatic fracture that happened when they were young. But as they age, the incidence of new vertebral fractures is more in women. All types of vertebral fractures are associated with uh, uh, serious morbidity. So all types of fracture, whether they are radiological or clinical, are uh, important. Uh, they do occur, though, at a younger age than hip fractures. And that's very important because the presence of vertebral fracture is an important early indicator of the disease status. So it's very important to pay attention uh, to that concept. And as I mentioned, it is difficult to determine the exact incidence in many countries, including our area, because most of the time it goes underdiagnosed. It is a powerful predictor of future fractures. So if you have one vertebral fracture, that means the patient will have multiple vertebral fractures. And also it will lead to fractures in other sites, like the hip and other fragility fractures. So there is considerable evidence that vertebral fractures are under reported and when they are reported no intervention uh, is happening and this is just a general summary of how common is the underdiagnosis of vertebral fractures worldwide in North America 45 percent in Europe 30 percent so it's a common problem everywhere and it's more so in our area and it's mainly because of poor identification of the vertebral fracture and the ambiguous rep reporting in some centers of uh, whether the vertebra uh, is fractured or uh, deformed. Now, this is a very important slide, and I'm sure the orthopedic surgeons will not be very happy with that slide, but it shows you that the mortality with vertebral fractures is almost that of a hip fracture. We always were scared of hip fractures, and we always believed this is the more serious that causes morbidity and mortality. We have data recently to show that vertebral fractures are as bad, particularly in men. So the mortality from multiple vertebral fractures uh, is as bad as a uh, hip fracture. And this is the famous FIT trial, the one that was done with the bisphosphonate. And again, it shows you the, uh, the uh, age-adjusted relative uh, uh, risk. And you can see that they are more or less equal between the spine and the hip. And that the mortality increases with the number of the prevalent uh, 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 vertebral fractures. Now, this is also a very interesting slide that tells you about how common are the occurrence of fractures once a patient gets one fracture. So women with vertebral fractures have five-fold increased risk of a new vertebral fracture and a two-fold increased risk of a hip fracture. So it is a predictor of future fractures, including the hip. And a woman who suffers a vertebral fracture has a 20% chance of having another fracture within one year. So it's a serious indicator of a diseased bone or of a high fragility uh, fracture. And of course, we are uh, familiar with the symptomatology of the vertebral fracture and that it is more frequent when you have multiple vertebral fractures. Uh, this is, again, I, uh, just to emphasize that prior fracture increases the risk of uh, future fractures independent of BMD. So regardless of the BMD of the patient, the presence of a fracture tell us that more fractures will be happening in the future. And this is more or less the same, the number of fractures increasing with time. Now, this is a slide that everybody has probably seen before, but I just wanted to emphasize that it's not just the skeleton we care about. The vertebral fractures actually compromises the function of the organs. So we get deterioration in the pulmonary function, deterioration in the uh, function of the organs in the abdominal cavity. Uh, patients get depression, they have reduced independence and reduction in the quality of life. So it's not just that we care about what happens in the skeleton, it's the whole body uh, that uh, is affected. And as I've mentioned before, despite their major personal and societal impact, vertebral fractions often do not come to clinical attention, mainly because two-thirds of them are not uh, brought to medical attention with no clinical symptoms from the patients. But the other problem is that they go undiagnosed. Radiologists and physicians do not diagnose promptly vertebral fractures, and they do not report it, and they do not record it in the files of uh, the patient. Uh, in a large population of osteoporotic women who were recruit recruited for a therapeutic trial, 30% of them had vertebral fracture 
undiagnosed. And that was in a center focused on osteoporosis. So the, the, the problem is even more common in the general practice. And as I mentioned to you, they are not appropriately reported in radiology and medical records, and therefore they do not come to our attention. In another study, an elderly hospitalized patient who just had a routine chest x-ray for lung diseases, they found that less than 50% of vertebral fractures were identified. So again, a very common uh, uh, problem. And in another study, only 40% of older women with vertebral fractures visible on X-ray were referred for a DEXA measurement and uh, did not receive uh, osteoporosis treatment. So in summary, what we know about vertebral fracture is that they are common in both genders, but more so in women, that uh, they herald the occurrence of other fractures. So there's a higher prevalence of other fractures, uh, four to five folds uh, more risk of vertebral fractures, two to four fold uh, increase of uh, other fragility fractures. They are is associated with increased mortality, more or less like the hip fracture. They uh, incur a huge morbidity uh, in patients and it's a clear indication for the need of treatment of osteoporosis independent of BMD and other risk factors. So just the presence of a vertebral fracture alone without BMD, without other risk factors is an indication for treatment, is an indication to screen the patient for osteoporosis and uh, to treat that patient. Now, many of you are familiar with the tool we use to assess osteoporosis. We call it dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. It's available in many uh, big centers, but even when this machine is available, unfortunately, we don't use it for evaluation of vertebral fracture. So most of these machines have software that can, can assist the presence of silent vertebral fractures for you. Unfortunately, most of us, we do not use that tool uh, uh, regularly. So um, um, uh, probably, well, well, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over that slide. So uh, if we have the DEXA machine in our hospital, we should make sure that we probably can also assess the vertebral fracture using the same uh, uh, tool. Now, many of you will be uh, hearing about the FRACs, so I, I thought I need to uh, just present one or two slides. Now, this is an attempt by the WHO to um, uh, assess the risk factor or the risk, the, the absolute fracture uh, uh, risk for a patient so that we can identify them early on and target them with therapy. And it stands for fracture, for fracture Risk Assessment Tool. They include many risk factors that have been validated in epidemiological studies to be independently correlated to a fracture uh, and also without a BMD. And it calculates the 10-year probability of a fracture. It has emerged as a very important tool in the clinic because you can download it from the net uh, and you can just, uh, it's an algorithmic uh, calculator that you can assess the probability of a fracture uh, in a patient. So how do we manage uh, vertebral fractures? Now, the, the, um, the short-term management is usually addressed to uh, pain management. Uh, so usually the analgesia, the physical therapy, uh, our colleagues will address later on the vertebral augmentation. Uh, but we are also lucky to have many uh, uh, um, uh, effective medicines. 20 years ago, we had maybe just a couple of drugs that we can treat osteoporosis with. Now we are fortunate or unfortunate, I'm not sure about that, but we have like seven, eight, nine uh, uh, medications uh, available. So it gives us um, um, uh, a big arsenal to use in the management of osteoporosis. They are broadly divided into anti-resorptive and anabolic agents. Uh, maybe I won't have the time to go over all of them, but I'll just go quickly over a couple of important ones you are familiar with. Everybody's familiar with the estrogen, the selective estrogen receptor modulator, the bisphosphonate. This is the new drug that we might address later on, the denosumab. And they all reduce bone resorption, but eventually they also reduce bone formation. And that's how they increase the BMD. Anabolic agents, you've heard about the Forteo, the PTH. So we use PTH to stimulate bone formation. Don't forget that they also stimulate bone resorption. So um, it's, it's, um, it's a different mechanism we can talk about later. Strontium renate is another drug that is available. It's not FDA approved, but it's commonly used in Europe. And it does not really act on the remodeling process, but it does strengthen the bone tissue. And that's how it reduces the vertebral uh, fracture. All of the trials that have been conducted on uh, osteoporosis with 
different medications have shown efficacy between 30 to 70 percent reduction of vertebral fractures. So they are all effective when it comes to reduction of vertebral fractures. Um, so quickly, just to go over the medications, we have calcium and vitamin D. We don't have enough evidence to support that alone. They do prevent the fractures, but all the trials with medication have used calcium and vitamin D along with the other therapeutic interventions. So we have to use calcium and vitamin D. Hormone replacement therapy, everybody is familiar with the estrogen and what happened with the WHI trial, the Women Health Initiative trial and the side effects. So we don't use estrogen frequently as we used to uh, do before, but it's one of the options available. Uh, CIRMS, you are probably familiar with raloxifen. It's available in our hospital. Again, significant reduction in vertebral fractures. And we have the new CIRM, which the basodoxifen. Uh, we'll not go over the details, but more or less they are the same. Bisphosphonates, uh, you know that they are uh, anti-resorptive by their action on the osteoclast. You're familiar with the alindronate, and again, 30 to 50% reduction of vertebral fractures. Residronate, more or less the same. Ibandronate, uh, has the beauty of being taken once a month or a parenteral form. We also have now the lizolidronic acid, which is a parenteral once a year medication. All of them reduce vertebral fracture by around 40-50%, uh, except for zolidronic acid, which is as high as 70%. So they are all very effective medications. Uh, side effects, probably, I'm going to skip that. We can discuss that later on. But just to address uh, some of the other drugs, calcitonin, some of you are familiar with that. We don't use it routinely. It's very good for analgesia, but not very good when it comes to prevention of fractures. And this is the new drug you probably will hear about, denosumab, that acts. It's a monoclonal antibody that acts at the final step uh, at the osteoclast uh, function and uh, reduces the function or the resorption by the osteoclast. Uh, and, of course, we have talked about the PTH. I'm just going to skip over those to show you a summary of all the drugs that we have for osteoporosis. All of them reduce vertebral fracture by an equivalent rate between 30 to 70 percent. So uh, just as a, uh, as a summary of what I have mentioned, uh, prevalent vertebral fracture should be considered as a strong indication for anti-osteoporosis uh, treatment, except when, of course, you have a high trauma fracture. Uh, you, we, we know that it can uh, predict future fractures and that we have uh, good therapies to address uh, that. So we should be serious when we um, are screening patients for vertebral fractures. And the key messages to take home is that, most, that vertebral fractures uh, are usually secondary to fragile bones, to osteoporosis. They are usually underdiagnosed and they are not reported uh, commonly. That's why we should be looking for them. And if we have a state-of-the-art DEXA machine like we have in our hospital, we should use it to address the silent vertebral fractures. And it can be performed at the same time. You do the BMD and you do the uh, fracture assessment and the, at the same time. And we should be careful about how we report a fractured vertebrae because there is still a lot of ambiguity when it comes to reporting. Action is needed by radiologists and by other clinicians to address the problem and to recognize it as early as possible and to refer patient as soon as possible for anti-osteoporosis therapy. Thank you very much.